Um, while we're waiting for the panelists to join us on, on stage, I just want to um, thank Pat and the organization for uh, inviting me to participate really in this closing session for what's been um, a pretty insightful and ex inspiring and informative uh, last three days during the, the uh, Connect conference. And in all transparency, I'm certainly going to be relying heavily on Pat to uh, co-moderate this session. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the families um, from whom, you know, I have learned so much over the last, you know, almost nine years that I've been in this community. I've had the privilege of meeting many of you, and in particular, a very special group of uh, women who, you know, have really entrusted me with the hopes and the fears, insights and expertise that's really driven some of our, our programs and my own knowledge. And then for today, really the the responsibility of bringing forward the questions that they're, they're asking uh, and, and we need to address and for which we'll really frame the conversation today. Um, many of my Pfizer colleagues are in the room today, so I want to thank them for allowing me to enable such an, you know, a talented, talented team over the years. And then all of you who represent different functions and, and individuals, our industry peers, all of which really, you know, and I think this was illuminated over the last three days, really a shared purpose to advance research, but really elevate the care. And that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today is, is the path to combination therapy, right? Once you have dystrophin, what is, what is next? Um, You know, the following, I'm going to set the stage, and setting the stage is really about uh, the individuals and families who are progressing through an experience on approved therapies um, and or uh, investigational approaches aimed at restoring um, or replacing dystrophin and are asking questions about clinical care, some of which are, are broad to the Duchenne community, but some of them may be very specific to some of these you know, therapeutic uh, or investigational approaches. Um, and maybe they, they have unique you know, questions and issues, and we need to explore those. But like all families with Duchenne, this, this wait and see approach weighs, weighs heavy. On, on the families, um, because I think we recognize that the universal desire for, for all families is really to keep any benefit of, of the therapies going. Um, and so I'm going to go through a couple questions that are frame the conversation. These are coming directly from uh, families who have their children on experimental gene therapies or antisense oligonucleotide uh, therapies. Um, and they're really to, again, frame the conversation. We may not have direct answers right now, but it does um, illuminate really the current concerns, right, and the emerging priorities that we're all kind of task to, to understand and, and, um, and solve for, right? The question of, of steroids, right? I think as long as I've been in this community, right, it's what's, you know, what's the best steroid management? What does this look like? And now, you know, when dystrophin is being expressed, right, what, are, what does steroid management look like? You know, what's the best regimen? Um, are steroids still the best and only supplemental treatment for boys post-therapy? Could steroids be reduced significantly? And I think, you know, this was kind of addressed in some of <clears throat> the panel discussions as we talked about, you know, uh, two-year follow-ups and, you know, what, what might happen in these longer-term follow-ups for gene therapy. Um, and what is the, uh, what will be or what is the role of newly approved uh, therapies um, or steroids as they come on board? We've heard a lot over the last couple days about the importance of cardiac health. Uh, Chet has lent his time and talent in many sessions uh, to address some of these concerns. And it's nice that it's coming into this conversation as, as a summary and hopefully we'll share some of the things that have been discussed uh, throughout the Connect conference. Do individuals uh, having um, received gene therapy uh, need increased cardiac uh, health monitoring? 
How frequently should be that be? How, what should it look like? Would mandatory MRIs uh, at least once a year be, be beneficial? What do they mean? What do the changes mean? Um, should additional cardiac uh, blood biomarkers uh, be, be taken and, and looked at and, and watched? And if so, yes. Which ones? When? How often? Um, redosing, we know that this is uh, of paramount concern um, in the uncertainty of, of durability for some of these uh, therapies. You know, will potential redosing, and I don't think it's necessarily will it, but um, you know, uh, when will it be needed given differences in response to the therapy? What will drive redosing? Um, do we have a sense of how often dosing will or may need to be done? And are there, what are the ongoing studies? Are there ongoing studies? What are these approaches to redosing? These are the questions coming directly from the community. Combination therapies, what will be the approach to combination therapy, leveraging other approved therapies? How, how are we gonna get there? And when we think about data sharing, we know our families are, are uh, participating in, in studies, right? And is there an opportunity, we hear this from the participants, is there an opportunity to share individual data uh, with the families as they progress through the post-dosing experience? Um, parents have verbalized that they see um, value in, in understanding any effect that dystrophin replacement or restoration may, may be having and, you know, some of these, uh, you know, outcome measures, right? Dystrophin expression, positive fiber versus all of this. You know, there's a feeling that perhaps these can drive some decision making as we look to additional care that may that may be needed. Again, from the parents' perspective, um, and then, you know, how can you know, sharing data, enhanced communication across clinicians. People are searching for answers with. Uh, you know, amongst different clinicians and, you know, can some of this data sharing or enhanced data sharing really get to some consistency in care recommendations? So that, you know, is, is kind of the background uh, for this conversation, you know, and again, as we're advancing, you know, these approaches aimed at restoring and replacing dystrophin, how do we in parallel advance care for individuals and families with, with Duchenne? Um, you know, I think, Chet, you mentioned the other day that care is really going to follow the science. Um, and I think, you know, what we hear from the families is, you know, we, we understand that, but in the present, as Chris says, you know, we're living in the present, you know, what is the care that needs, needs to happen, you know, in, in parallel to, to the science? Um, and we all know uh, and feel that um, time is the precious commodity for, for our families. Um, do we have the systems? Do we have the studies in place? Or do we need to develop them to address our gaps in knowledge, which have been kind of illuminated throughout the past three days, and to lay out what that optimal care pathway really looks like for, for these families. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of kind of the, the, um, the important questions that these families are, are asking as, as we're in this uh, gene therapy investigational environment. We have folks on, on approved therapies. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna ask that all of the panelists kind of briefly introduce themselves. I know that this audience is, is very familiar with them. Um, but upon the introductions, then we're gonna go kind of into questions. But we want this to be more of a town hall active discussion amongst uh, members of, of this audience. You're invited to contribute your comments, answers, uh, questions. We want this to be quite dynamic. Stan. I'm Stan Nelson. I'm a uh, father of Dylan, uh, Michelle Nelson, who's tootling around here somewhere. He's 21 years of age. And I'm also a professor, uh, geneticist at uh, UCLA, helping to care for boys and performing research work at UCLA. Hi, uh, I'm Krista Van Borna. I'm a faculty at the University of Florida, and I direct the Imaging DMD project, which has been uh, following the natural histories using MR imaging. 
At Chet Villa, I'm a, a heart failure and transplant cardiologist. Um, I also um, am one of the leaders in our Neuromusk Clinic. I'm also the leader of, or one of three leaders for um, actions of muscular dystrophy. Um, and yeah. And I'm Pat. <laughs> I'm Claudia Sinisak. I'm a clinical professor at the University of Florida and the project manager for the imaging studies at the University of Florida. Thank you. And, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on um, cardiac care in, in over the last three days. So I'm going to start with you, Chet, and some of these questions. Um, I know you've addressed many of them, not only in your practice, uh, but through the last couple of days. But maybe this is a good opportunity to summarize some of them. Um, you know, you've seen these questions, you know, at the heart of it, literally, uh, is the heart built, you know, to last. So, you know, what what do we need to be doing to learn more about the heart when dystrophin is newly being expressed? Well, so I think the first thing is, is we need information and, and we need to, the, the data sharing point is, is a huge one because even if you uh, have heard and seen in multiple slides that people are saying, you know, somewhere around 100 boys have been treated, it turns out, if you saw one of my slides earlier, to be able to answer the, the basic question about ACE inhibitors, which is a fundamental therapy, right? It, it took about 500 boys and it took them about 17 years to answer that question. That, that's too long. And so I think the first part is, is we do need to share data, we need to understand, and we need to standardize how we're looking at things. So we're comparing apples to apples. I think that's where the imaging DMD stuff is terrific, right? There may be some bells and whistles you do at one center, but we need to harmonize. We need to say, here are the things that we think are, are, are consistent from a cardiac phenotyping perspective, and one that we think is important and that we can use to follow over time. And so that way, no matter which center you're at, we have a general idea of what's going on. And if we're getting those same data points at other places, we could actually start to compare and see if things are changing over time. The other thing that that informs is when we're talking about, you know, it was brought up in terms of steroids, but I think the question of what, what do you do in terms of your cardiac therapies? You know, my answer right now is I would treat you the way that I would any other time. Until we have data to prove otherwise, you know, time is muscle. Full stop. Let, keep coming back to that, right? That, that's what the adult cardiologists say um, in terms of prioritizing time um, from, for a heart attack. I think that's the way we have to think about it. And then as the data rolls in, in a timely fashion, underscore timely, then we can start to talk about peeling back therapies. Because until we have that, we don't want to look back in five years and say, oops, we had an opportunity to, to change things. It's easier to peel those back. And so just to press on that point, mm -hmm. um, you know, we need, we need a better understanding. We need this data um, to drive the clinical care, the changes to uh, the guidelines and changes to care specifically for Duchenne. You know, what's, you said 17 years is too long, but in between too long and when, you know, when, when might we see some of those, those changes and more directives in terms of cardiac care for? So I, I think for the first part, this is where we have to say thank you to Pat and to PPMD. I, I think the, they're giving us an opportunity to actually collect that data. Because otherwise, if you say, you know, we'll use Cincinnati as an example, and, you know, nationwide is a similar way. So I'm taking the two largest programs that do the most cardiac MRIs, um, either historically or currently. Um, and we probably have somewhere around three to 4,000 MRIs back of the envelope mm -hmm. calculation. To be able to just collect that data, go back, remeasure, and get it, you have to have someone sitting at a computer for literally a year to be able to do that. It is fundamental to understanding what we need to do, but we need resources to do that. And so I think that is the first step. Get that data, but continue to harmonize along the way, right? We have to be able to, you know, pat our head and rub our stomach at the same time. And, and I think the first part is getting the data, but then also as we're going along, ensuring that what we're collecting is going to be um, what we think is the, is the best for moving forward. So right now we're working on harmonizing that from an MRI perspective 
to say that right now, so we're doing that as we look back retrospectively to kind of get as much of a natural history as, as we can. And I, and I think there are enough centers now that are, that are coming on board that, that I feel comfortable that we are going to have that data. And what we would be looking at based on what we're estimating is within a year to a year and a half. We will probably have earlier readouts of that um, in that time frame. And so one of the things as we're, as we're talking about is, is we will have you know, quarterly little readouts that come back to the leadership group. And then I think as we look at that data going along and we feel more and more comfortable with it, getting it out to families is a big thing, right? And you think about the teenage, you know, when the, when the tweens were up here talking about what they were doing and when we talked to the men, they were also saying, we need data. We need it now, right? They sit awake sometimes in bed, stare at the ceiling and wonder what's going on. We need the data now, um, and then we can work back from that. Thank you. You've, you've referenced, referenced the work that, that Chris is, Kristen is doing, so I'm just going to kind of shift and, um, you know, ask you to kind of give the audience, you know, a little bit of an understanding of, of what you're doing in the imaging DMD study, you know, looking at cardiac and, and skeletal MRIs. Um, but maybe you could share with us what exactly is being done and what are we going to learn about the boys who are now expressing, you know, some form of, of a dystrophin? So, um, as part of Imaging DMD, we have now collected more than 10 years of natural history data. And I'm going to echo here, data are really important. And those data provide context, right? If you look at one boy individually, it's very hard to interpret that. So, we have a large data set that allows us to really understand what the natural history of the disease progression looks like. So over the last couple of years now, we have followed a number of boys uh, that have been treated with gene therapy. With the support of PPMD, we've committed that we will enroll additional subjects, that we will collect the same data that we have done as part of the imaging DMD study, so we can directly compare them and look at the changes in trajectory if they're there. Uh, we have expanded also doing cardiac imaging that has been done by Dr. Walter uh, for now probably four or five years. So we have quite a bit of data on the cardiac side as well, and we'll do the same exact thing. But I, I totally agree it comes down to having context and really uh, looking at the data very quickly. The other part, to come back to the data sharing that we do as Imaging DMD, we really feel it's our responsibility to share back the data with the families. And we really are very active in that. We share the data immediately. We also provide context so that they understand the data because I can appreciate the anxiety of the parents. So having that data, I think, is, is very important for them as well. Mm -hmm. And on the, the theme of data sharing, you know, do you currently share that data with maybe the sponsors of the trials that they're involved in? Is there a plan to share that with companies? You know, maybe working groups that can kind of better understand this data and form future clinical trials. You know, what, you know, beyond individual participants, is there a plan to, to share data? So two parts of that. One is we are uh, helping a number of different uh, sponsors that are executing clinical trials right now with supporting them with cardiac MRI as well as a musculoskeletal MRI so that they have the data and that they have high quality data and understand those data. In addition to that, the data we have acquired as part of Imaging D or our NIH funded studies have also been shared and some of it have been published as well. Thank you. And I'm just, again, we want some audience participation. You know, we've kind of talked about some natural history study, you know, longitudinal data. You know, are there, are there questions on this theme before we kind of move to some, some other domains for questions? Anything for, for Kristen or for, uh, for um, Chet? Sorry, Krista. I think the other thing as someone's coming up is we also have to have a way to present it for the boys and families, no matter where they are. Um, we can't get up there and show scientific graphs. 
I mean, just full stop. There have been study after study, no matter what subspecialty you're in, is finding a way to convey it, and especially for teenagers and young adults, we have to do it in an age-appropriate way. They need the data, they want the data, but it has to be done um, with that in mind. We can't get up here and show things that it took me till 33 years of age to study to learn how to interpret. One question about the imaging DMD. Like, having seen the results and like the data, would you recommend like a family with a Duchenne boy to do uh, imaging every year to sort of, you know, like monitor the progression of the disease and sort of like have their own data to be able to make better decisions? It was hard for me to hear. Sorry, can you speak closer to the microphone? So basically, I mean, would you recommend, based on what we have seen in the imaging DMD study, would you recommend families or asking the clinicians to do yearly MRIs to track the fat fraction or any other sort of like parameters that you can gain to understand the progression of the disease in their specific boy? So I think this is an easy answer. My recommendation is you get an MRI anyways if you want to understand what's going on because we know the limitations of, of echo and especially for right the age at which most of these boys are dosed. So if you weren't here for the other natural history stuff that we know on average LGE, cardiac fibrosis be, uh, develops at around age 15 and then systolic dysfunction squeeze changes don't happen until you're 20. If we're following echo, we won't see those early changes and there are even earlier changes that I don't want to get into too much because we're still trying to make sense of those but things like myocardial edema and other stuff that may give us an idea if there's inflammation going on in the heart even before the scar forms and so my answer to that is I, it's standard of care in Cincinnati full stop and for us to be able to make sense of this I'm not putting it on you but I think that's what we need it's the only way we're going to make sense of it from a cardiac perspective in a timely way. Again, not waiting till these boys are 20 to understand that. I, I think for cardiac, I understand that it's, it's more followed. I, my question was more around skeletal muscle. Can, so for you, can you speak? Uh, yeah, so my, my question was more around skeletal muscles. So should yeah. we be doing MRIs for skeletal muscles, like maybe a specific muscle every year to... Want it to, like understand the progression of the disease. Yeah, I think for us to learn and to understand and for you to have that information, absolutely. Very similar to what we talked about, the cardiac MRIs, to have the MRIs and to do it on an annual interval, yes. Uh, I had another question about uh, like, so uh, there was a, in the slides that you talked about earlier, there was a question about biomarkers. So, like, given the, like, uh, again, like, for progression or to see the effect of a therapy, can, can we, like, is, are there biomarkers that we can sort of, like, re request our doctors to, to, you know, monitor and, like, do, do those tests regularly and uh, monitor the progression of the disease? So from a cardiac perspective, I think it's important. Imaging is a biomarker, right? You're trying to get an idea for an ultimate outcome that doesn't necessarily measure it directly. So I would consider imaging that. The other ones that we have are actually later stage and really a reflection of uh, how your body is responding when your ejection fraction goes down. So I would say those are going to be late findings. I think MRI is the best and the earliest marker for what we have for disease. And let's talk about it. like it is, an, it is a biomarker and a clinical test that is effective. And it's the best one we have right now. And, and if I remember correctly, Chet, you had made some comments the other day in your session around troponin, right? And this is something that we really have to better understand in the context of natural history, which I think you're getting to is, you know, if, if you're do, taking you know these blood biomarkers, do we really know what changes mean? And the answer to that is probably no, because we don't have you know these longitudinal studies specific to Duchenne to understand what's the baseline kind of behavior. You got it exactly right. So think think about troponin at least right now, like CPK, and as you've heard from you know over many years. Um, it, it reflects that there is injury, but, but there are other uh, prognostic markers that are significantly better. There, now, then you also see you know, some of the gene therapy stuff where the CPK, when you're a seven-month-old, goes to nothing. 
that is significant, but we're not there yet in terms of understanding troponin. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is if, if we think harmonizing from an MRI is pers a perspective is challenging, there are more assays in more hospitals for troponin than you can possibly imagine. So comparing apples to, to apples is, is an even harder situation there. Yeah. And can I just add to the, to the question? Because I think part of the question was sort of what biomarkers do we have in terms of skeletal muscle disease progression and what can you learn? And we're a little bit, you know, we, we sort of spend time thinking about what biomarkers are, you know, how do we sample it? Is it blood? Is it an MRI biomarker? But we actually have muscle, right? And we can look directly at muscle. And I think, you know, one thing that I think we're, we're, we will likely push towards is how can we better look at muscle in terms of have we have we remodeled muscle? Have we changed the fibroblast populations? Have we changed the fibrosis? Have we changed the immune infiltrates that exist in muscle? Have we made the muscle fibers healthier? Right? What combination of things are we searching for that mitigate the disease process in the tissue that is most important, which is unequivocally skeletal muscle? We don't have those yet, but I, you know, just from a broader arc, we actually have four drugs approved purely based on a biomarker, which is dystrophin induction, right? So all four exon skipping drugs are on accelerated approval because of dystrophin being induced, directly observed in the muscle. We're not doing serial muscle biopsies. We're not doing them based on the way we're doing them in clinical trials because it would be obscene to do. But do we have kind of a clear logic and a clear way where you could reasonably sample, you know, relatively surface muscle that's giving you insight. And I do think we have a bead on how to go about doing that, how to go about doing that ethically, how to go about doing that in a way that's not that much more invasive than a blood uh, biopsy. So I think there's things on the horizon, are they here right now, maybe not, we can do things. And then we need a map, we need a roadmap of what do those changes mean across all the different therapies in a way that you can use sensibly. So a very complex question that you're asking, obviously. We want to shift to the other side of the room. You have a question? Hi. Uh, I have uh, two practical questions um, uh, regarding MRI, cardiac and skeletal MRI. Do you guys have protocols in place in your institutions so those MRIs can be uh, done at different locations and sent to you remotely? So in terms of doing MRIs at different centers, so it's really important that the data are collected in a harmonized way, the same as what was mentioned here. So um, that is really key. So again, you have that context. Otherwise, you're comparing apples and oranges. So I think there are many centers that could do similar measurements on our end. I think we have worked with 30 different sites across the United States and Europe now to run the protocols, but I think it is important that they're standardized and using the same methodology so you can actually compare them. Yes, and that's exactly what I'm asking. Uh, your experience with those different centers, are they standardized? Are, is it easy to standardize them? Uh, I think that it is very feasible to standardize it. I think the most important is that you really have people that are focused on standardization. So sometimes when you go for an MRI in a clinical setup, they're not necessarily focused on doing quantitative MRI. But I think if you have people that are focused on doing research and collecting the data in a rigorous way, I think it's very feasible. And we've done it in many sites now. Just follow-up question. Uh, you know, I mean, I see the value to do MRI, cardiac and uh, skeletal for younger kids, like three, Four years old who is not going to be very compliant with the MRI. Do you have any um, sedation protocols in place uh, uh, for those kids so it could be done earlier? Yeah. So we typically start doing MRI at age of four and we don't use sedation. We typically have the kids watch a movie. Uh, that's our, it's amazing how good kids are, little boys watching a movie. So that's how we typically do it. I have to say we also have typically a good team in place that can, you know, help with the behavior of the kids, but we do not sedate and we start at the age of four. Now, if you want to go younger than that, you probably have to sedate. 
Yeah, so we never sedate. Um, we can usually get it uh, at somewhere between seven and 10 years of age, depending on the boy um, and how active they are. Um, and even if you look at what data we have, about 10 to 15% of boys will have evidence of LGE before age 10. I, I would ethically have a real challenge um, when the when your yield is probably going to be less than 5%, depending on that age, of putting somebody to sleep. Um, and so we haven't done it from a cardiac perspective, and I don't see that changing. The other thing that's important for harmonizing is also from a clinical trial perspective. We need to have an imaging charter so that we say, no matter which trial you're on, we also can compare. Because that then sets up a way for us to generate larger volumes of data in a shorter period of time, and again, not wait 17 years. Thank you. Okay, we have two questions over here, and then we're going to maybe switch them. I think that leads into my question, too. I think my favorite word this week is harmonization. And I'm curious your thoughts on how this work can translate into platform trials. Great question. Great question. <laughs> I didn't hear the question. Sorry. I Does that question this work translate into an opportunity for platform trials? Yeah. Is that so, fair? So I think this is fundamentally where we need to go. I, I use oncology as an example. If a child is diagnosed with cancer in the United States, you are in a clinical trial and it is set no matter where you go. So as a physician, when you're there and you're on rounds, they say, this is Johnny, he is seven years old, he has this type of cancer and he is on XXYZ protocol and it's the same forever. And then all of these groups come together to write those protocols, to publish it, and to work together. And that also minimizes the number of, of different variations that you have. And in a world, it would also, if done right, minimize the amount of people who are on placebo. All right, so I'm just going to interject before you know Susan comes to the microphone. Pat, I would imagine you have a couple comments around platform trials and where there may be an opportunity in getting to combination therapies. Sure. So we, we thought, it, we have thought much like the oncology group or the COG, children's oncology group, um, thought that a, that a uh, master protocol would be very useful in this, in this community that would theoretically enable everyone to be in a trial, that data was collected and shared in a very specific, rigorous, standardized way, and that therefore we could try different approaches on different cohorts of, of individuals and see quickly yes or no, this is working, this has po you know, positive signs, go forward or, or negative and stop. We, we also brought that, um, we had a team of people working on it. it we have a fully fleshed out uh, master protocol that we can begin again. We were sort of on a roll and then the pandemic happened and obviously things slowed down a bit. But I do think this is something we should bring back out. Um, we had a type C meeting with FDA. They were very acceptable of the protocol, had a few questions. Craig McDonald, Richard Finkel and others have been really seriously working hard. And I do think this is something we should share, bring out to the community because I think the timing is right for a master protocol, especially in the instance of people who have been in a gene therapy protocol or who have dystrophin expressed in tissue. Thank you. Susan? Uh, I'm going to sound like I'm changing the subject, but um, I'm going to guess that w when I ask you this question, Pat is going to answer platform trials. So we just heard from Linda and from Paolo, really exciting news. I think we're all starting to have greater confidence that new drugs will be made available in the not far distant future. Um, it would be perfectly reasonable, it seems to me, that patients and families are going to be asking, you know, I'm already on this, does it make sense to do that? And which one, or can I have all of them, or whatever? So, um, we, we know from other science that, you know, you, these molecules happen to be working through different mechanisms, and it could be that there's not really much added benefit on top of existing therapy, 
Or it could even be that two and two makes five or six or ten, right? But you can get synergistic responses. So how are we going to figure out, how would you, you guys like to see um, those questions answered? Um, because we presumably need to know if there's, if there's, you know, it's really great if you put this one and that one together, but not so much if you put this one and that one together. And drug companies, of course, are focused on their own molecule and bringing their own molecule to patients. So who's going to study um, how these multiple therapeutic possibilities work together? All right, so can I ask Stan to take a stab at that question? Because I would imagine this is exactly the question that your patients are asking in a clinical setting. Um, and as a parent, probably something that you're asking you know, yourself. How do we add on new you know, and, and different yeah, medications? I mean, yeah, I, so I think all clinicians are faced with this issue for, for all sorts of areas. It's true in, in heart disease, it's true in cancer, it's true all throughout medicine and it's true in Duchenne already, right? We, you know, do we withdraw steroids because somebody gets exon skipping? No, right? So we're already making those sorts of decisions right now in terms of what sorts of therapies are relevant and uh, likely to be helpful in combination, really based on what we think we understand about those mechanisms. So we'll keep doing that. But I think to get to, to Susan's question is, yeah, we will have categories of drugs whose mechanisms are sometimes very well defined and other times modestly well defined and in other times really quite amorphously defined but helpful, right? So and they all get through FDA approval, say. And then you want to be able to look at you know, what that combination, what that timing, how you use things over time. And you know, other areas of medicine have plowed through this already, right? So like you, one could use children's oncology again as a, as a pretty robust area of looking at this just for ALL and the combination of therapies that were all FDA approved and just used in different combinations, different timings, finding people who are resistant, finding people who are having early responses, finding people who are having late responses, helps refine how you use everything in combination we're not gonna be different, right? We're gonna to need to do those studies. We're gonna to need to figure it out. I love the idea of platform trials as Pat is sort of uh, provoking, partly because across a host of things where we don't necessarily know, we don't have the clear logic of how to combine them. You know, we don't have that clinical acumen because we don't have that data behind them. Uh, test, right? Data is always better than no data. And as long as it's safe, as long as it seems plausible, as long as we have a mechanism to kind of walk in A plus B, A plus B plus C, A plus C plus D, right? Whatever complex it gets. You know, as long as we have sort of a mechanism to have a, a group thought about that, I think it's gonna be the, the most efficient way to try to get at some of these questions uh, rather than really clever ways that we're combining just A plus D only and we didn't do a trial about that. So I think there's kind of an inevitability to it, but you know, it requires a massive coordination across a really broad enterprise and it's difficult to do. I'll just reiterate the other part to that is um, around do we know what dystrophic muscle looks like? I would argue we don't fully know at the atlas of cells, cell types, changes, looks like yet in a human dystrophic muscle. So we're just getting the tools to do that now. So then once you know what it looks like in a dystrophic muscle without any dystrophin, do you know what it looks like when you have a little bit of dystrophin, a lot of dystrophin, a mini dystrophin, a micro dystrophin, however you want to name it, then do you know what it looks like when you've perturbed it with this steroid or that steroid? We don't know those things yet. How do we know those things? I think we're gonna be ill-advised to do those solely from clinical measurements, right? So it's not gonna be necessarily just a North Star. It's going to be looking at accessible tissue, which is muscle, mm -hmm. and we will make progress much faster. So combination therapies, repeated, simple, small, without question, needle, absolutely not open, muscle biopsies, periodically over time gives us this dimension of data that we have not yet seen yet, which will be critically important for making more rapid progress. 
that's my crystal ball, but you know, I think that's what it looks like. The other thing about harmonizing that I think is important is we have to take some responsibility for that. One of the biggest impediments to harmonizing is, is the medical apparatus. You know, being a little more humble and saying, when we don't know the answer, let's come to something that's pretty darn close and let's go with that so that we can try and answer these, these in a, in a data specific way. Because right now what you get is people just say, well, I want to do it my way. And that's where I think your voice matters tremendously. There are a few things that can get doctors to come together more than you guys saying, this is not okay. Leave your egos at the table, come together, find something that you agree upon if there is no data, and then let's move forward from there. Your voice matters tremendously to get us to do that together because we are often the biggest impediment. So I'm going to shift down the line um, to uh, Claudia because, you know, Stan, you brought up we need to know more about kind of the pathology at the cellular level of dystrophin, you know. But every day, you know, these folks who have received therapies or they're on these clinical trials, you know, Claudia, you're seeing them in a real world setting and kind of maybe functional changes. Can you, can you share with us what, what you're seeing, right? And then what you're seeing, does it translate into any changes that you might recommend um, or share with the families in terms of exercise, stretching, their physical therapy regimens? What are, I mean, we've heard anecdotally, for example, Pat mentioned the other day, um, you know, perhaps, you know, there are changes in lordosis and the children are walking straighter. What does that mean? You know, are we measuring it? Number one, right? Are we seeing it? Are we measuring it? And then are we making recommendations related to changes in exercise and physical therapy and stretching? That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> Giving you the floor. <laughs> um, I want to start with, with the observation part. Yeah. Um, I think some parents have reported that their sons look like they're standing up straighter and that the lower dose is, is less. And I certainly don't want to negate those observations because those are the kinds of things that we, we need to hear when we're not with your sons every day, 24-7. Um, those are important observations. We have not been measuring that. Um, it's very difficult for... Um, your private physical therapist to have a way to measure that? Is it something that we could quantify by doing something like motion analysis? Absolutely. We could measure that. Do we have a pre-measurement right now? No, because we haven't been doing motion analysis where we're putting on reflective markers and looking at your child walking from all different angles where we can actually look at the changes in lower doses and in other parameters of their gait pattern. Um, but it's something, it raises the question, should we be doing that? Um, and is that another marker of um, you know, a, a functional measure that we might want to consider? in something like um, the group of boys that are getting uh, gene therapy and receiving microdystrophin. In terms of exercise, um, in this population of boys that have received um, microdystrophin, the question always comes up about stretching. Should the stretching be different in this population? And I guess the first thing I want to stress is that every boy that has Duchenne, whether they have been treated with gene therapy or not, their therapy program should be individualized. Everyone should not be treated exactly the same because even though their diagnosis may be Duchenne, each boy is moving a little bit differently. And so their program needs to be individualized for what they're doing 
and how they're moving and how their disease is progressing. So even in the boys that have been treated with gene therapy, in terms of stretching, not every muscle needs to be stretched. Not every joint needs to be stretched. We're looking for those areas that are tight and have that um, propensity to get tight in what we know about the progression of the disease in general. So we know, for instance, heel cords tend to get tight. So that's something that we might want to target for someone, whether they've had gene therapy or not had gene therapy. We want to maybe pay attention more to that. But not every joint in the body needs to be stretched. And that's where the individualized um, therapy plan comes into play for your son. In terms of exercises, the boys that have been treated with gene therapy, they look stronger. Functionally, they look like they're capable of doing more. And when we look at them individually, um, we can develop a plan of care that is targeted for them that um, allows them to participate in exercises or in mobility, in participation in general, that is suited for the stability that they have, for the strength that they have at that time, for the um, mobility that they have at that time. Can I tell you what that is in general? I can't because it has to be individualized for your child. And I know that's frustrating um, because I don't have general guidelines, but we just don't have enough research on it. We just don't, we're not far enough out in monitoring boys that have had gene therapy to have general guidelines for every individual boy. So. Thank you, thank you. I wanna be mindful of time. We could go on with questions for days and days and days. I know you've been standing at the microphone for some time, so please. Thank you. So combination therapy is something that we need to be explored like right now, like today. So I was just wondering if any of the pharmaceutical companies or anyone has thought about um, maybe dedicating a leg of one of their clinical trials strictly to boys that have received dystrophin, whether it's through gene therapy or exon skipping. Um, maybe I was thinking of Edgewise um, when I heard her speak earlier, or any companies. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna invite, because I don't think we have any you know, sponsors on the panel right now, but if there are you know, uh, clinical developers in the room from any of the companies, please, anybody interested in fielding that question? And if you don't offer, I'm gonna put you on the hot seat. I thought it was a good question. All right, so now I'm just gonna have to point fingers. Dan. <laughs> Thanks for that, Catherine. <laughs> I'm Dan Levy, I also work at Pfizer. Um, and actually, I'm really ill-prepared to answer that kind of question because we are performing the gene therapy uh, trials right now, but we are, do not have any um, additional modifying agents in the pipeline. So I, I, I really don't know if it's appropriate for me to respond to that. I do think that some of the other representatives from the other companies have sort of left the building, and so they're probably not hiding from, uh, from the question. They just may not be here to answer it. All right, so Joanne, are you in the room? Because Edgewise was called out. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Well, it's, it's a very important question. How are we going to uh, include these in our clinical trials? 
And I think that um, it's something that we should work together as a community for guidelines. How do you include patients who have been on gene therapy? How far out? Uh, you know, because what we did hear yesterday was that most of the side effects of gene therapy are within the first 90 days. But I think it would be helpful for us all to kind of come to a consensus on that. Uh, but I will say that, that this is something that we've been thinking a lot about uh, and talking with folks about the best way to approach this because clearly combination therapy is, is what is needed ultimately. So just to comment about that, um, I think people who are in a gene therapy protocol hear obviously that once they're in the protocol, they can't be in another protocol in the middle of there. But then there, we're hearing about this five-year FDA follow-up within that period of time of that FDA follow-up, um, are you, what's allowable? I mean, if Joanne or Paolo or, or Linda decide, all right, I'm going to have an arm of my study or I'm going, to, I'm going to develop a protocol for people who've been in a gene therapy protocol, do you need to be mindful of a five-year window or can you, as soon as that trial is completed, allow those individuals to enter a trial with Edgewise, Capricor, you name it, PTC, you know, would PTC, other, anybody else? Um, I think it too, so the, it's true the studies are five years. They include observation out well beyond two years. Um, I believe, I believe that there is a possibility of after, two years after treatment of um, a participant in our trial receiving other experimental therapies. Uh, and that would be the case, I think, both for the open label trial that we have right now as well as the uh, blinded trial because you'd have, um, so, so I, 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 think that, I, I think that could be a possibility, Pat. Yeah, I think there was a little bit of a discussion, um, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, time is slipping, um, specific to steroids, right, in these five-year periods, uh, follow-up periods, and to, to Dan's point, I think specific to steroid regimens, I, if I remember correctly, you know, there is that clinician-driven decision after two years to say how do we, you know, um, change or, or think about uh, changes in the steroid regimen. Oh, we have. Hi, I'm Narissa Crayer, the Chief Medical Officer at Entrada Therapeutics. It, just think, I, I want to add the, the context, right, of the drugs that we're studying that aren't yet approved and differentiate drugs that are approved and drugs that aren't approved. Because when drugs aren't approved, we have to be incredibly careful that we're able to tease out what is the safety signal of the drug we're studying. And so there are complexities of making sure that we don't muddy the waters by combining things. That's not to say that it shouldn't come, and I fully agree with the community that it absolutely should. Some of this is related to a timing issue. The other thing I think that's really important for the community to, to know is that every drug is different. And so we have to look at this on a very individual basis to understand what is the safety signal of each drug we're studying. And, and really there's not an easy way to make a blanket answer to the question because every drug does behave differently and we have to understand that. Right, so you know, kind of do we understand the mechanisms as we, as we think to add these on? Um, but I think the unique situation here, right, is that those having received gene therapy can't go through a, you know, washout period, right? So we have to be thinking about, um, you know, what, what is next for them and if it's, you know, um, other investigational therapies, how do we get to that? But to your point, you know, how do we add on, you know, drugs that may become approved? Um, Pat, I'm just going to defer to you for timing. Any final questions, comments? Just a question for Stan. Sure. <laughs> Imagine that I was in a gene therapy, not me, my, my children were in a gene therapy protocol and they were amenable to an approved antisense. 
Would you feel comfortable um, prescribing that? Do you think that would be synergistic, antagonistic, complementary? And would you do it? And then what would you ask of me to make sure that we were doing something that uh, was be useful? Yeah, I mean, you sort of bring up an exact issue of, you know, what's the molecular target, right? So in both instances, the molecular target is sort of treating the proximate genetic cause of Duchenne, which is the loss of dystrophin. You know, do we, uh, so uh, my answer would be, uh, yes, I would prescribe. And the reason for that is that uh, they're a bit subtly different dystrophins potentially, and they distribution of how the dystrophin might be expressed across all the myofibers can be different. And as gene therapies are being, hopefully, commercialized right now, they're actually not targeting the stem cell at all. And there's the plausibility that some of the antisense therapies can actually be treating partially the stem cell defect that does occur in muscles. So there's a few logical reasons which are, you know, slightly overlapping. Uh, so, you know, and, Am I on firm ground to do so? No. Is it reasonable to do so? Yes. Would people do it? Yes. Would I do it? Yes. Uh, would I want to have muscle biopsies? Yes. Would it be difficult for me to ask you for that? Yes. <laughs> would I want the muscle biopsy to be as minimally invasive as humanly possible so you'd be willing to give me a second and third and fourth? Yes. And do I want to do everything I can with those muscle biopsies, including deep genomics and research on them and develop new things, yes. So all those are yeses and they're all, they're all complementary and they're all in the same goal and in the same service of learning about what the disease looks like as we shift the disease. We're not gonna, we're, we're you know, yeah, we're, the evidence right now is that we're not curing the disease, we're not, but we are, you know, even with the, the two presentations we just had, we're definitely treating the disease. It is shifting. Do we know what that shifted disease looks like? Do we know what that shifted disease with two different therapies are and steroids look like and the steroid or that steroid? We don't know that yet because we haven't really looked yet in a systematic way. So I, my, I believe we're going to be, and we ought to embrace the complexity of uh, medicine ought to be a dynamic learning environment. And I completely agree with Chet that medicine gets in the way of doing that because of just absurdities. But we ought to create the enterprise here within our own rare disease community to make that enterprise as robust, efficient, cost-effective, maximum information comes out from it as possible. So, long-winded answer. Well, and I think the, the systematic sharing of data, it is why I'm here today, right? Cardiomyopathy, two and a half decades ago was very rare. Now, the leading cause of death in Duchenne. We found a way to treat skeletal muscle and respiratory disease, and now we have to find a way to treat cardiology, but the same thing applies throughout. We're gonna shift and treat, but we have to be watching so it doesn't take 20 years to figure it out so that we can learn in real time or semi-real time. Thank you. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to give our final question to Seda. I think you're at the, the microphone. Hi. This is more of a comment, I think, some food for thought rather than a question, so I hope that's okay, um, and you'll grace me that. I kind of wanted to pull some of these points together in the, in the idea and the spirit of speaking about harmonization, the inertia towards platform protocols, and some of the questions we've seen around uh, combination therapies, I'd like to just maybe pose this as food for thought for a lot of the companies that are recommending or s suggesting or, or hinting that their, their potential therapies, their products can be used in, comp in combination. I think that give some sense of potential responsibility on these companies and these sponsors to take the initiative to do that investigation and that safety study and have a safety cohort completely adjacent to the primary endpoints of the product being studied on its own within just Duchenne, uh, especially since we have so many 
uh, so many participants in gene therapies and oligonucleotide uh, products and platforms, I think this is becoming more and more critical for the patient base. And to add to the point of Dr. Villa um, highlighting that time is muscle, I think this can be significantly beneficial for the patient base in that spirit as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think we want to. Yes, I think we will. Uh, I, mean, I guess from our, our community as a responsibility, I think you all have made the point that we need muscle. I think we need to think about and work through. I mean, the thought of putting my son under anesthesia to get a muscle biopsy long, long ago, I found, was incredibly terrifying. I find that some of the young men, when they have a muscle biopsy and are scarred, then want to wear long sleeve shirts or don't want to go to the swimming pool, depending on where that biopsy was taken from. So I think, but as a community, if a muscle biopsy, a needle muscle biopsy, that can be done with out anesthesia and hopefully with much less scarring is what you need for us so that we can get to combination therapies and cardiac MRIs that should be standardized across and, and as a community we should insist on them. I think we can make progress because time is muscle, time is heart, and we have so little time um, to really move this forward. And it seems like with the breaking news we've had, so much incredible opportunity so I'd like us all to think through that for as a community of parents and, and young men and some women with Duchenne to give that muscle biopsy with that thought that we can make progress and for all of you to stop with the medicine. I mean, I don't mean stop with the medicine. You, and I, you know what I mean. Whatever medicine, whatever pieces and parts of medicine hinders you, that we work together to try to break those barriers because it, I think our families need and deserve the help. And I'm grateful to all the companies. And I just wanted to wrap this, this meeting up because this is the last in this dinner and you've sat for a very long time to say I'm grateful to all of you. I didn't know that we could be in person. I was hoping we could be in person. I had visions of every one of us being tested positive. And then I thought, well, if we're all tested positive, we can all just keep going together. <laughs> and I didn't want to be the super spreader event of the nation, but I am grateful that all of you came, that you were all together. I hope the fundamental goals of, of PPMD were realized in you. This is a Connect conference. This is about connecting to each other, to companies, to healthcare providers, to other parents, to young men, to the young women with Duchenne, because connections are what's important. You saw today in, in the Italians, how Filippo brought a product to a Talapharmaco and that, after four years, meet, met his primary. You heard about Kath Juraskaya, who came to Linda Marban. So all of this begins at the bottom with us as patients and families who think of good ideas and say, can you, and willing people who say yes. And then we see the benefits of possibility of gene therapies, antisense oligonucleotides, HDAC inhibitors, Capricors, cells, PTC, stop coding, all of this coming forward for our boys. So I just wanted to say this, science will win, medicine needs data, and we all have superpowers. And those are, in my view, connection, empathy, laughter, and joy. I heard a lot of that here. I'm grateful to Nathan and, and to Rachel who came, to Sean and, and to his wife, his beautiful wife and beautiful Rachel and all of the people we've had here and to Chris Jones who makes me cry every time even if I tell him 20 times and text him not to do that. He always does and he always touches me. I'm grateful to you. Thank you for sitting here. Thank you for coming. I hope we see you next year in Dallas because it matters. Thank you again. Thank you.